Thank you, Neha. Um, it's really an honor to be here tonight to talk to students. I had my children in the school district back when we had to cut the career counselor position from our budget, who used to be Cindy Raby, and she was really good at her job. So I think it's really uh, big kudos to you guys for identifying that gap and doing what you can to help fill that and expose our students to opportunities that they might not even know exist. Um, so as Neha mentioned, I started out my career as a technical and professional writer. And when I was preparing for tonight, I thought I would try and put myself in your shoes as students and think back to when I was in high school. Um, I graduated from Waialua High and Intermediate School on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And um, it was nice. It was kind of like Ashland. It was a close-knit community where there were just a lot of wonderful opportunities to do different things. Um, I was the runt of the litter. I'm the youngest of 10 kids, so I played outside with my siblings a lot, but we didn't have a whole lot of organized sports at that time. So my interests went more into academics. Um, and now, raising my two daughters who have just graduated both from Ashland High, I look back and I think, wow, I was in this little tiny school on an island in Hawaii, and we actually had AP courses 30 years ago. And I thought, that's really special. Um, we also had National Honor Society, which was very different. I was at an assembly one day and they called my name and said, congratulations, here's a certificate and a pin, and I was in. I've watched my daughters have to go through the application process and um, really build up a resume that would lead to induction in National Honor Society. So um, things can happen many different ways, but the blessing is that we're given these opportunities at such a young age to begin exploring who we are and who we might want to be in the next chapters of our lives. Um, I was fortunate to be able to serve in our school student government, and I really appreciated working with everybody on the projects that we did in that. I was the editor of our high school newspaper, and I think that allowed me to connect with the writing bug. Um, I've always done writing. I can remember making a little book when I was about six years old and you know, writing it and illustrating it. So I think that's probably always been part of who I am as a writer. Um, I also got to do a lot with the drama club, and that was a whole lot of fun. And so the composite of those experiences led me when the college counselors started calling us into their office to think that maybe that's where I would like to parlay my next step as I go off to college. So being the youngest of 10 kids raised by a single parent, college was not an opportunity for all of my siblings, but it just happened at the time that I was coming through the system that I was a good student, I loved school, and so I had good people in my school district who could then guide me into going off to college. So they told me about a career fair up in Honolulu, or a college fair. So I went to that, and I met a representative from Northeastern University, and I knew I would be putting myself through school, so their cooperative education program was really quite attractive to me. And I had grown up in California till I was 14. I went through high school in Hawaii, and I thought this could be one of the rare opportunities where I could do something really different. So I came to Boston, um, and I didn't know what that was going to be like. Um, I came all by myself, sight unseen, at 17 years old. I took a plane from Honolulu to Boston. I got off, I went down to baggage claim, I found another kid going to Northeastern, we decided to split a cab, and the cab brought me to Punter's Pub on Huntington Avenue. <laughs> and I'm looking at the taxi driver and I said, so is this where I belong? And he said, oh yeah, your dorm's back there. So that was my start in Boston, and it was just a really incredible opportunity to be a young independent adult um, I thought I had signed up to be a broadcast journalism major. And when I got to school, my file wound up in the communication studies department. And the journalism department was a different department. But the people in the communications department were really very kind to me and they kind of adopted me and gave me a work study job. And I just found my home away from home there. Um, and so I did the curriculum for communication studies. And as many of you may know, Northeastern has a pretty awesome co-op program. It's the premier program in the United States, if not the world. 
Um, and so again, you know, I was just following the path. Wherever I was supposed to go, that's where I went. But I got exposed to some really great co-ops. Um, my first one was with the Metropolitan Center that's now called the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. And I got to be the assistant to the special events coordinator. And that was a lot of fun. Um, I got to help put together Barishnikov's ballet, his Cinderella ballet. I got to be there when David Copperfield came and did his magic show. Um, he wanted a piece of gum. I got to give him a piece of gum. Um, and other shows like Sugar Babies, and we did um, Private Lives with Noel Coward's production and Elizabeth Taylor. You know, just all these amazing people that without my co-op at Northeastern, I would have never, ever probably been exposed to. So then I went back to school, and when the next um, co-op opportunity came up, I had... Um, been doing some TV production work in my studies and we had a studio on campus called Network Northeastern and the goal of that was to tape courses that were happening out in industry and then stream them and people could watch them at their leisure on their work breaks. So that was a great opportunity to get hands-on experience in a studio and learn to do the production. Um, there was one woman who was teaching a class and she had like two or three big chalkboards next to each other. So normally what you do is you videotape as they're going along the chalkboard, right? And all of a sudden she becomes a switch hitter. So I'm following her along like this with the camera. And all of a sudden she just puts the chalk in the other hand and starts writing this way. <laughs> like, ah! So you just, you know, you adapt, you develop resiliency skills and you make it happen. And then as I aged up through Northeastern, I had the opportunity to take a co-op job out at Colonet Software and I got to try on some shoes for technical writing. And that was really fun for me. I enjoyed the whole process of working with um, a marketing manager, a product manager, our program managers who are doing the development of software systems. And I would document what our internal systems were and then I would test my documentation and I would go in and help the programmers to find bugs before it got released. So that was very rewarding. And as I was graduating, um, I mentioned that I did work study in the Department of Communication Studies. They actually needed a full-time secretary when I was graduating. So I was given the opportunity to work full-time for Northeastern during the day and then take courses toward my master's at night for free because I was a university employee. So I didn't make very much money as an administrative assistant in the department, but I got to work with the people I'd been with for five years, um, and I didn't have to commute. I was right on campus. I just you know, could do some of my school work between the time that the office closed and then the time that I had to get to class at night. So it was a really sweet deal. If anybody wants to pursue a higher degree, if you have the opportunity, working for the university is a really nice way to do it. Um, so I earned a master's of technical and professional writing from the English department. I was in the first class that was offered that degree. And so one of the points I wanted to impress upon you guys as you're building up your resumes and getting ready to apply for colleges or to go off to colleges is leave yourself wiggle room. Because when I was 17 and filling out my college apps, Tech writing wasn't even a career option. It did not exist yet. So if you can get good solid skills in college for how to communicate, how to write, how to speak, how to think analytically and critically, those are the soft skills that any company is going to need. They can teach you the technical parts of your job, but it's very important that you as an individual invest in yourself and develop that kind of a skill set. So I graduated from Northeastern as a double Husky. I got my bachelor's in communication studies. I got my master's in technical and professional writing. Um, and then I started in on my first career. But while I was at Northeastern, my boss, who was the chairman of the communication studies program, had recommended me for a new program Northeastern was launching. And they basically hired a New York City consultant to come in and set up a program for the admissions office so that we could then call students at the point when everyone's gotten all their acceptance letters, have other students call them and say, 
I go to Northeastern, I'm studying what you think you're going to be studying, what can I tell you about the school? So I ran a telemarketing campaign for Northeastern University while I was an undergraduate student. Um, and that was a really great set of skills too because I could take all of that management experience with me as well as the nuts and bolts of how to run a telemarketing program. So when I started my career, I was offered a position with a company called State Street Consultants and I was hired to be their tele-research manager. So again, I ran a department. I wrote the scripts for what we were doing. We basically serviced the printing and publishing industry. And we would call people who work in print shops, who work in design studios, and ask them about the nature of their work, what kind of equipment they used, what kind of equipment they would think they would need in the future. And then we would compile that data and give it or sell it to the manufacturers of the equipment so that they could see what the trends are so that they would then know what products to bring to market. So from being the tele-research manager, I was promoted to become the communications manager. So I oversaw the tele-research department, but I also oversaw the other side of the house that was taking all those studies and data entry and putting them into the computer so that we could then run analytical reports. So I got to expand my role to double it. Um, and one of the projects I was most proud of there is that I designed a communication audit because, and I don't think this is uncommon in a lot of companies, you have one group doing this over here, you have another doing this over here, and three or four other over here, and nobody really understands what the other groups are doing. And when you're in a silo like that, it's easy to think that what you do has the most bearing on the company. So I conducted a communication study that I wrote, researched, wrote, and executed, and then I shared it with all of our management team and then we went out and trained every employee in the company on what the whole cycle is in what we did in that company. And it was just beautiful to see everybody come together and say, oh, so that's what you do. Oh, so I get that now. So that's why I'm doing it this way. And it was just a really great experience to take my communication background and apply it in real time to a company and make a difference. Um, from there, I went and worked for a company called Sterling Office Services, which was a placement firm in downtown Boston. And they had five different uh, offices. And I was in the corporate office, and I was the marketing manager. So we got to do things like put out weekly advertisements in all the local papers. Um, we would arrange programs for our employees who were out in the field temping for us. We would bring them in for luncheons once a week so that people could get together and talk and compare notes and build a community. Um, I also did all of the proposals for Fortune 500 companies to get the business so that we could then provide them with their staffing. Um, and that was really a great company to be in. But that was one of those jobs where you have to give everything that you have all the time. And by then I had gotten married and I knew that if I stayed in that kind of a pressure cooker environment, I would never be able to grow a healthy baby in my uterus. So I made the decision that that was not a healthy environment for me or my future family. So it's awfully nice when you're choosing a career, if you can research and see what kind of flexibility do you get to have in your choice. And I think today, you know, 20, 25 years further down the road than where I was, I think flexible work time is often built into a lot of really good companies. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. You know, how married do you want to be to the job? What kind of work family life balance do you want to try and strike out? Um, so from there, I decided I would go in as a consultant and I started my own business called The Right Idea. And I was very fortunate to get some really good contracts through that. Um, back when email was first starting to become a thing, I worked for a company called Freemark Communications, and they put out a product called Freemail, which was basically you get advertisers to pay, and then you can offer free services for email. And I got to do their marketing writing, I got to help do some of their tech writing, and that was a lovely contract. Um, and then I spent a lot of time with a software development company called More Systems, and again, it was a small, they were a small consulting firm, and they had people out at Raytheon and a number of other, you know, major companies in the New England area. 
And I was in the office, one of the few, because when you run a consulting firm, you want everybody out in the field. But I got to work with the president, I got to work with the sales team, I got to work with the marketing folks um, and the developers. And I helped to document their security system that they sold as a product. I helped to do their marketing plan. Um, I got to place articles in trade journals. Uh, we also did some survey work in that company as well. So it, it's just been very wonderful to have a writing background because you can parlay that into so many different things. When I was at Northeastern, there's a um, kind of a world-renowned uh, social, um, what was his title? Well, Jack Levin, he's one of the world's top people on serial killers of all things. Um, but he taught my social psychology class, nicest guy in the world. And when I was graduating and told him that I was getting my master's in technical and professional writing, he says, oh my gosh, you're gonna have the best career. He said, you can write your own ticket and you can do anything. And those words in that tiny little conversation really stayed with me to give me the confidence that yeah, you can pretty much go out there and do whatever it is that you think you want to do with your career. Um, so after I worked for more systems for a lot of years, I went on to um, a headhunting firm and was hired to go down to Rhode Island to Fleet Bank in their technology division for a three month contract. And that three month contract was to help them document their new business initiative procedures. So when they bring a new company in through this whole period of mergers and acquisitions that they were doing, how do we integrate all that into our IT department? Because they're coming in with their own systems and their own procedures. So I got to help them document how their new business initiatives would be handled. And then that three month contract, somebody else there picked me up for another contract and somebody else picked me up for another contract. And I wound up staying for about eight years. Um, and it was fabulous. And most of that I spent as a telecommuter. So I worked out of my home here in Ashland. I had partners in Texas, I had partners in St. Louis, I had partners in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And because of technology, we could very easily do our work from wherever we sat that day. Um, and then I had an opportunity to help build their technology policies program. So I mentioned all those mergers and acquisitions and everybody was coming into Fleet Bank from, you know, we had a Latin American affiliate, we had people all over the US and all these companies had their own way of doing things. So what we did is we standardized it. We put in high level policies in 17 different areas of technology to say this is the what that we need to make sure we're all doing alike. At the local level, you are free to figure out the how, but it all needs to add up so that we have consistent, repeatable processes across the board. So that was really kind of awesome to be able to help build that. And we built it for Fleet Bank and then we got bought out by Bank of America. And when there's a big merger like that going on, nobody knows if their job is going to be secure. Um, and so projects kind of start floating in midair and you're not sure whether you're going to be there tomorrow, your boss isn't sure they're going to be there tomorrow. Um, but because I was a tech writer and I had done a lot of resumes in my work as well, um, I just started doing everybody's resumes while we were in this holding pattern. So, you know, from the top of the house all the way down to the guy sitting next to me, I kept busy for a few months by writing people's resumes. Um, they were paying me, so I wanted to be productive. And you just never know where your writing skills are going to come in handy. So we worked for years with Bank of America. We rebuilt that technology policies program to suit that company. And um, as we were launching it, I realized my daughters, who were um, who were probably about 11 and 7 at that time, would be turning into teenagers pretty soon who probably didn't want mom around very often. And I had worked out a sweet deal where I worked three days a week so that I could be primarily a parent during those years and then also earn a professional salary. So I asked my manager, I said, you know, the policies program is just about ready to launch and to go into maintenance mode. What would you think if I asked to take the summer off so that I could actually spend time with my kids? Because if I worked three days, I'd have to put them in camp and camp goes for five days and then I wouldn't get to spend time with my kids. So she said, 
great idea. She said, when I got married, I took a sabbatical and it was the best thing I ever did. It gave me a good mental refresh from work. When I came back, I was all excited again. And I thought, okay, that's really awesome and very supportive. So I did. I took that summer off and two weeks into my perfect summer, my older daughter Zoe was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, I don't know if anybody here has it or has a loved one who's experienced it, but basically 95% of people with diabetes have type 2. When you have type 1, you cannot regulate through diet or lifestyle choices. Your body is no longer making the insulin that allows you to stay alive every day. So I had to come up to speed very quickly and it was really a blessing that I was on sabbatical from work at that time so that I could be there a thousand percent for my family. And we, um, we figured it out. They, you know, Zoe was very independent at age 11 and she wanted to do the math calculations herself to figure out how much insuli insulin she would need. Um, so, but there's like a six month curve before you can talk to your doctors about maybe going on an electronic device, an insulin pump that will allow you to get your um, insulin without having to do an actual shot every time. So I went back to my managers and said, you know, we're on this learning curve. Would it be all right if I extended my leave of absence until the end of the year to make sure that she's really okay? And they had done a huge reorg, a reorganization within the company. And they said, actually, we've eliminated your position. You are welcome to come back, but we would need to put you on the line as a line manager instead of as an independent contributor as I was as a tech writer. And I thought, you know what? that's not gonna work because my family needs me more right now than my profession needs me right now. So I um, filed for unemployment and just so you know the first level is refusal and that was hard because I'd been paying in all those years out of my paycheck for unemployment and they immediately off the top just refuse you. So know that you don't have to be rude, you don't have to get in their face, but you do have to be persistent and come back. I was able to collect unemployment for a little bit, which was great. Um, and then I realized that I really wanted to be home raising my own family. And so during that time, I was still able to be very active in the community and use my writing skill set for volunteerism and for good in the community. So um, I had my kids at the hairdresser one day. I don't know if anybody knows Lisa Natoli down on Cedar Street. But I had the kids in her house in her little salon and she said, so Cece, you're a writer, right? And I said, yeah. And she said, would you like to help the Ashland Education Foundation do some grant writing? And I said, sure, who can I talk to to find out you know, what that means? And then I found out there really was no more Ashland Education Foundation. The folks who started it had um, built it and Tom Sanicandro had incorporated it as a nonprofit for us. But then everybody kind of grew out of it and, and went in their own directions. So what the problem was is Middlesex Savings Bank kept sending a thousand dollar check every fall and they were feeling very guilty for that check coming into their mailbox with nothing really going on. So I approached Superintendent Hoffman at the time and asked if he could help me restart this education foundation. And then another woman, I don't know if anybody here knows Claire Cushman or Sumner or Camille, but her mom um, was entering the district right around that time. So Cindy and I, uh, Cindy Hoyle and I, reinvigorated the Ashland Education Foundation. And in that role, we ran seven different campaigns to get technology into our schools. So I got to use my writing skills. I did all the publicity around the foundation. We got the Media Lab in Warren School set up. We got the Media Lab in Mendez School set up. We got the sound system in Warren. We got all the science laptops in the middle school. And then I had an opportunity. We had a, um, a private benefactor in the corporate sector who would recycle or cycle out their uh, CPUs, you know, the hard drive for their computers every three years and they would cycle them out automatically every three years to get the latest technology, but they were perfectly good machines. So our IT director back then arranged to have them donate all that equipment to the district. 
And it was great because technology was just really starting to take root and that would allow us to have more than just the teacher's computer in the classroom. But the problem was is we had those old fat CRT monitors and the scientists were starting to show that they were biologically hazardous. They threw off an electromagnetic field that upset our own biochemistry. So we decided to run a couple of campaigns to replace every CRT monitor in the district with the new flat screen LCD monitors. Um, and so that was great. I was really honored to be able to not only take care of my family, but to use my communication and writing skills to serve my community. I also taught CCD, or religious education, for 10 years um, and helped out in the classrooms. Wherever I could, I would just lend a hand. So I was asked to sit on the um, allergies committee, the life-threatening allergies committee, and I helped them write up their procedures for that. Um, and I also was able to help write up a swim team manual. Um, and when we had to let go of our school librarians at the lower grades, I wrote up a manual for how to run the libraries with our parent volunteers. So even though I wasn't getting paid for my work, it was still very fulfilling to be able to use my professional skill set. Um, right around that time, Zoe was, she was a rock star. She was doing so great with her diabetes management that after four years, I decided to um, re-enter the workforce on a part-time basis, but I wanted to stay local just to be sure I was there on the front lines. And our grant coordinator for Ashland Public Schools was leaving the district, so I applied for the job, I was given the job, and in that role, not only did I run the government grants for the district, but I also went and uh, found out about Donors Choose, which is a crowdfunding source for teachers. So basically, the teachers could post a project and we would do some publicity around that. And then parents and other community members would pony up and help pay for whatever the teacher wanted. So I was so proud of our efforts. We hit the 100 mark. We got 100 projects funded for Ashland Public Schools to bring in iPads and Chromebooks and minis and you know smart TV. And, and through the Ashland Education Foundation, I helped teachers to get things like smart boards and um, all sorts of what we thought was great wireless technology. And then I was at book group one night and a girlfriend of mine is an electrical engineer and she said to me that there could be something up with Wi-Fi. And I thought, hmm, I just kind of filed it away. But not long after that, something crossed my path in written form that indicated there could be something biologically harmful with Wi-Fi. And so I went back to our IT director. I said to Alan Graham, you know, this is the first time hearing about it. What do you know about it? And he said, I've never heard of it either. And, and he's a techie, right? So I said, hmm. And he went off and checked. And he comes back and he says, oh, the FCC says it's fine. And I thought, OK. But I, by then, being a writer, research is a huge part of a writer's job. So my skill set said, go in and investigate. And it didn't take me very long at all to discover that scientists all over the world have done thousands upon thousands of studies that show wireless technology is biologically hazardous. Um, but at that point in time in 2013, I didn't know what I know today. I have studied this issue for four years now. I've had the privilege of meeting many of the top scientists and doctors in the world um, because we all want the same thing. We want safe technology. And the message is not no technology, it's safe technology. So um, when I raised this with Ashland Public Schools, we were at a very unique time in our history. We were on our fifth superintendent in five years. And Superintendent Adams um, came on as our sixth superintendent at the tail end of these discussions. And what happened was this. There is a huge body of scientific evidence. And the bioinitiative report was done by a bunch of scientists to see what is this technology? What does it mean in terms of public health? We know that wireless radiation is radar. It came out of our military. It has been designed as a weapon. Um, but in 2007, a group of world scientists got together to say, OK, People are starting to deploy this in the commercial sector. What does that mean? 
And they said, we really need to do more research to understand that better. So for the next five years, not just a couple studies, but 1,800 studies were done all over the world. And the vast majority of those studies showed biological effects. Um, and so they tried to tell our government that, as you may imagine, there's a huge amount of money to be made by industry with um, telecommunications, with energy, and with technology. So even though the scientific evidence was there and our school committee could see that, there was also another body of evidence over here that said, huh, we did studies and found no harm. At the time, none of us understood that those were by and large industry-funded studies that were conducted under conditions that would show no biological evidence of harm. But we didn't know, you know, none of us were versed in this. And our school committee really just wanted somebody higher up to tell them what to do with this issue because they weren't scientists, I wasn't a scientist. Um, but we did have some people in the community, very well respected, very well regarded, who would come to school committee meetings and say, you know, our children deserve to have the best of what technology can offer, so we think it would be a bad idea to do anything in reverse with wireless radiation. But to the school committee's huge credit, when they read the fine print that comes with every one of our devices in it, way down, actually, does anybody have an iPhone? Those of you who have an iPhone, if you could take it out, and go into settings, I'll walk you through what the industry actually tells us, but that nobody ever actually sees. Are you stretching or yawning? Okay. So give a nod when you guys are there. Okay. You go into settings, and then you go down to general. From general, click on about. And then from about, Scroll all the way down to legal. And then toward the bottom, you'll see RF exposure. That's radio frequency radiation exposure. And if you read the couple of big paragraphs that are there, one of them will say, use something that creates distance. Use speakerphone or use a headset. And then if you read a little bit further, it will recommend a certain distance to keep that device off your body, right? I, for the iPhone, is it like five millimeters? Is that what you're seeing there? So whoever knew that was in there? Whoever knew that by touching your devices right now in active mode, you are exceeding the FCC guidelines for public radiation emissions? So to Ashland Public Schools, huge credit, they decided that since there was nobody at the DPH who could instruct them on this, there was nobody at the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education who understood this issue, to their huge credit, when they read that fine print, they said, well, why wouldn't we do what even the manufacturers are telling us to do? So I only had orange paper, but hanging in yellow, laminated in all of your classrooms throughout the district is this sign. And it says, turn off those devices when not in use. For you guys sitting here tonight, if you would just put it into airplane mode, that cuts off the radiation. Simple. Nobody knows it though, right? And then you just turn it on when you actually need to send and receive data, then put it right back into airplane mode. You can actually compose a text, you can compose an email in airplane mode, set it on a table and hit active, let it transmit and then put it right back in airplane mode and you have reduced your radiation exposure exponentially. Um, they also said, turn the Wi-Fi on only when needed. You know, right now, the standard mode of operation is all Wi-Fi all the time. So we are sending data back and forth through two-way microwave radiation all the time, unless we learn about this. And then the answer is simple. Hardwire your stuff at home, hardwire your stuff at work through an ethernet cable, and then you just go in and turn everything off, right? Turn off your Bluetooth antenna, turn off your cellular antenna, turn off your data antenna, turn off your um, locator antenna. 
turn off your Wi-Fi antenna. So every one of your phones has five different antennas in it that is constantly pulsing for a handshake with the nearest router or the nearest cell tower. And it's invisible and we can't see it, smell it, taste it, or hear it. Yet it's all around us all the time and we have overwhelming science that's telling us this is biologically hazardous. But again, back at this point in time in the fall of 2014, when Ashland Public Schools rolled this out, um, they rolled it out the first day back to school for faculty and staff, and I was actually sitting right about there because I was the grant coordinator. And when I first saw this, it said best practices for wireless uh, safety. But then it read best practices for mobile devices. And, you know, I didn't really understand what a mobile device is. That wasn't a term that we used. You know, you had a cell phone, you had a laptop or whatever. And as they did this, then they went on to teach about anti-bullying and physical restraint and all those other mandated trainings that our staff get every year. But they never actually told the teachers that this is electromagnetic radiation and that we should really pay attention to those signs on our walls. Um, so I went to Jim Adams the next day and said, you know, first I'm so very grateful that we even have this now hanging in all of our, our classrooms because I know of other districts throughout the country who have tried to protect their students, but because industry has been so influential in promoting their 21st century classroom, 21st century learner, their goal is to get one-to-one -one devices into the hands of our children, and they're not educating us on the biological effects. So I said, can we tell the teachers this is because it's radiation, and, and poor Mr. Adams had just walked into the district, you know, into this. And I, I had my kids at the high school, my older daughter, when he came in and turned our high school around and put our core values in place. So I knew Mr. Adams was a stellar administrator, but he just walked into this and he's like, I can only do what the school committee has proposed. And I said, okay. I said, well, can we tell the parents? Because if we can shut everything off at home, then the children's bodies can do proper cell regeneration at night if the cell phone's there, if the router's in the house, you know, if the tablet's there, all of that disrupts our sleep and our circadian rhythm, which prevents our bodies from doing proper cell repair and regeneration while we sleep. So um, he was like, really, I can only do what the school committee said. And I said, okay. So I had spoken to our town administrators during all of this, and I knew that they didn't, the health agent, the board of health, didn't know anything about wireless radiation. But the Board of Health agent had said to me, you know, I was in Ashland back when the cell towers came in, and we were told that if anybody claims harm from being under a cell tower, that we have to follow the state mandates and the state has to follow the federal mandates. And it goes to some telecommunications act that says, sorry, you can't come back and claim damages if anyone gets hurt. And I was like, well, what's up with that? But he was nice enough to reach out to the Department of Public Health um, and come to find out they didn't know much about this issue either. So I thought, okay, how can we just let people know? It's a right to know issue, just like smoking, drinking, pornography, tobacco, um, gambling. Those elements are always going to be in society, but people have a choice because we have the knowledge and we can choose how we want to behave given a given toxin, right? Um, so I thought, you know what? Let me see if I can meet with Senator Spilka, because Senator Spilka and I served together all those years on the Ashton Education Foundation. So Senator Spilka and I, we met at her coffee hours at Sunnyside, and by then I had invested in a meter that would allow us to measure the amount of microwave radiation in our surrounding areas. So I turned it on. And I measured Senator Spilka's laptop, and I measured her district director's cell phone, and both of them went off the charts. And they're looking at me like, really? And I'm like, yes, and nobody understands this. I said, is there anything you can do from the legislative end to help educate the public? So she put me together with a lawyer in her office. And he and I crafted a very simple bill that says, let's get the right bright minds to the table. Let's get pediatricians, school committees, doctors, environmental doctors, because our regular doctors have not been trained in this. So um, I was very blessed that that bill came up for hearing. 
Uh, right around that time, a group of world experts came to debrief the Massachusetts legislature. So for two years, I was the only one I knew who could talk about this. And to school committee chairwoman Lori Tosti's huge credit, she dove in and did the research with me. And, and we were like, whoa, did you see this one? Did you see this one? Look what this country's doing. You know, look what these guys are doing. Why aren't we doing that here in the U.S.? Um, but when Senator Spilka's bill came out, there was a panel of world experts that came to Boston to teach our legislators what this is. We had a Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate scientist. We had the scientist from India, who in the Indian government makes the recommendations for how much radiation the public can be exposed to. And their, li their public limits were up here. Dr. Sharma brought them down 90%. So ours are still up here. We still allow this much radiation, but at least he showed us that it can be done. They're still figuring out how to dismantle what's over there right now, but at least it showed us it can be done. We also had Frank Clegg come speak to our legislature, and he's the retired president of Microsoft Canada. And I was like, wow, we've got a tech industry giant here to talk about this. And he said, yeah, when he retired, he was on the software end of things, but he knew enough never to give his children cell phones, never to have Wi-Fi on at home, but he didn't really understand it all. So when Mr. Clegg retired, he went out and spoke personally to a dozen of the top scientists in the world and came back and said, our standards in North America do not protect us. So, you know, you got to love this man. He's such a sweetheart. He has dedicated his retirement to founding Canadians for Safe Technology. And he's now up in Parliament trying to get them to change their guidelines or standards so that we are not overexposing our population. Um, and then there was a, a child psychologist. And then at that point in my journey, I'm like, I thought we're here to talk about biological harm. But Dr. Catherine Steiner Adair was telling us all about the other part, the part of a child's brain that develops properly through human interaction and because we've just kind of had carte blanche with technology. She said all across the US, Asia, Europe, all these places she consults, she hears the same thing from kindergarten teachers, first grade teachers, second grade teachers. More and more children are coming to school who cannot maintain eye contact, who have not developed the human capacity for empathy. When something goes wrong, they don't know how to self-soothe and they expect their teachers to be edutainers, right? So she was telling us about the biological impact and how at every stage of childhood development, and I believe most of you in here probably saw screenagers when it was, you, that's what she was talking about, right? Um, so at that point in my career journey, we had a $2 million budget gap in Ashland Public Schools and they had to cut positions. We really wanted to preserve our classroom positions so we didn't overburden the teachers. So my position as grant coordinator was cut. And I had always told my husband, when I leave, when my last child graduates, I will leave the schools and go back to my full-time profession as a technical writer so that we can you know, prepare for our retirement. So I was let go from the schools a little bit earlier than I had planned, like two years earlier. And um, when Senator Spilka's bill came up for hearing, it was assigned to the Joint Committee on Public Health, you get three minutes to testify, and that's it. So I'm up there with Ashland's best practices, I'm showing them the science, and I'm showing them my meter that we can measure all of this. And as I was watching their faces, I could see that not one of them, prior to that testimony, understood that this issue even existed. So. I went back to my husband and I said, look, it's gonna take more than a three minute testimony to really get something moving to protect the public. I said, with your blessing, I would like to have a few months to start meeting with every one of those legislators to really educate them on what this technology means for us. And so he was very gracious and he let me buy some time. Um, and I did, I took the, sum, the fall, the summer, the winter, and I met with every member on the Joint Committee of Public Health. I met with the governor's office. I met with our Senator Warren's office, Senator Markey's office at the federal level. And I was using all those skills that I had developed as a communications professional and as a writer, because I would always send written information out, you know, do my thank you letters, my follow up. Um, 
And I was told by people on the side, don't get your hopes up, a bill never goes anywhere the first time it's introduced. And because it was introduced under my name by request, um, some would see that as a red flag to the legislature that they don't really need to pay attention. But because we had that panel of world experts come to Boston, a whole bunch of people in Massachusetts came out for that. So I got to meet people from communities all over the place, from Dover Sherborne, where they fought a cell tower on school property, the um, Board of Health agent in Framingham, the school committee chairwoman in Framingham, parents all over the state who have already begun to experience what electrosensitivity is. So when I talk about the biological effects, um, about the only thing we ever hear in the media is cancer. And you hear about cancer because cancer takes 20 or 30 years to materialize. And in that time, the industry can actually sell an awful lot of products, right? What they're not telling you about in the media, because if you look at the top lobbyists, the people who are pushing their agendas in DC, and you look at the top advertisers in mainstream media in America, it's the same group of companies. So we do not get investigative journalism done on this topic in the media because those network administrators can't afford to bite the hand that feeds them, right? It's a very sad state of journalism in our country right now, but it's the same thing with the food chemicals and Monsanto and what they're doing to our food stream. So it's very hard for people to understand that this has 24,000 studies done already. We finally started taking measures with lead when we had 10,000 studies done. So this is long overdue for the public to know about and to be able to take measures to protect ourselves. So when I met all these people, um, I used my organizational skills to build lists, to gather email addresses, and when this bill came up for hearing, I shot out an email to everybody and said, if you could please take a, a few minutes, send in testimony, and educate our legislators about what this issue is, then we can, um, we can hopefully make some progress. So we did, and that bill was reported out favorably by the Joint Committee on Public Health. We were congratulated, because that almost never happens. Um, but then it didn't clear the next hurdle. So I said, so what happens next? And they said, come back in a year, Every legislative session is two years long. We'll re-examine it and see what we've got. Um, and so I did. I went back to Senator Spilka's office, and they said, you know, she is now the chairwoman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Karen Spilka has a huge, huge job up at the State House. She's basically in charge of the budget in Massachusetts. So that doesn't leave her as much time as she once had for her district. But he came back and he said, let me check my notes. And he says, oh yeah, we are going to reintroduce that. And Senator Spilk is going to introduce it under her own name this time. And I went, yes. Then all of a sudden, other bills start popping out of the woodworks. Worcester now has a bill to protect people from utility smart meters that the industry wants to put on our homes that will emit radiation 24-7. Representative Dykema has a bill to get the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to do something about this, to protect our children in schools and our staff. Um, and then Senator Sear out of the Cape and the Islands, just like with cigarettes, when our government finally fessed up that that was a hazard, they label those packages now so that you can't buy one without seeing right on it that this is a biological hazard. So Senator B Sear has a couple of bills to label all of our Wi-Fi devices. So um, I, at that point, had, had learned about social entrepreneurs, those are people who really want to help society, um, but also need to figure out a way to pay the bills. So I read a book that was recommended to me, actually by a philanthropist, and I put together a grant proposal, and I reached out to this gentleman and said, would you give me a sanity check on it just to see if I'm on the right ballpark? And he said, sure, and if I like it, I might actually help to fund you. And as timing would have it, I was flying out near Silicon Valley, and he uh, was gracious to meet with me. I pitched my proposal, and he gave me a three-month pilot, and just because he likes the work that I'm doing and that we're making actual progress. Um, and so he has continued to fund me for the last year and um, is, is doing that so that if I give of my time, I don't have to go into the poorhouse by you know, selling off everything that I have just to do this work. 
for a product that was never safety tested. It was never safety tested for children or fetuses, the elderly, or those with known health complications. So, um, so now I am officially a technology safety educator. I do this full time. I go out to communities. I've met with the Framingham Board of Health. I've met with the Southboro Board of Health. I've met with other school districts. Worcester, just this quarter, is now offering <coughs> radio frequency radiation exposure guidelines on their school website. But everybody's just waiting for somebody higher up to tell them what to do. That's going to take time to play out. We can all make choices today to use hardwired technology wherever we can. If we have to use mobile technology, don't have it be your go-to playground. It's very hazardous. Put it in airplane mode when you're not using it. Um, and, you know, just, just start noticing. Maybe if you turn everything off in your house at night, maybe people will be sleeping better. Maybe we'll see fewer headaches. Maybe we'll see fewer nosebleeds. Maybe we'll see fewer ringing ears. Maybe we'll see fewer hearts racing with tachycardia. Those are all, or skin rashes that can't be explained. Those are all early symptoms of electrosensitivity. And a lot more people are starting to experience them today because it's cumulative. The longer we are in this environment, the more likely some people will emit symptoms. So I am now a technology safety educator. Um, that Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate scientist that came to Boston, she and I wound up doing some work together. I helped her do some grant proposals because she wants to do the breast cancer research studies. We now have women and men presenting with breast cancer from keeping an active phone in their pocket or in their bra. We have a lot of people experiencing uh, rectal cancers from keeping that cell phone in active mode on their back pocket. Um, it's not good for pregnant people because there's no barrier there to protect the fetus. And there's, a, there's just so much research showing that this is biologically hazardous. So Dr. Davis introduced me to somebody in the UK that recognized we have to have education behind this. And I have had the privilege of volunteering my tech writing skills to create online courses, literally in less than 40 minutes, you can take an online course that distills all the science, all the international medical advisories, and kicks out a tip sheet at the end that says, do this with your cell phone, do this with your router, do this with your car, do this, you know, blow by blow, it tells you how to use technology more safely. For less than the cost of a movie ticket, we just need to cover our expenses, we're not in it to make a gazillion dollars, but we just honestly feel the public should have a right to know. So that's where my journey has led me. I never in a million years imagined that I would need to be a technology safety educator today. But I'm so grateful for my education and for my work experience that led me to be here.